Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to, to come talk with you. And, and also you seem to have an amazing community. Like I love that the libraries are collaborating on these events and, and gathering things for people in Ukraine and giving out free COVID tests. It seems like a wonderful community. So yeah, thank you for including me in the series. And, and thank you in particular to Carolyn and Kathleen, and then also the co-sponsors of, of this talk, the Ruth Keeler Memorial Library, the Pound Ridge, Lewisboro, and Bedford Free Libraries, and the NS Open Land uh, Foundation. Thank you to all of you for, for making this discussion possible. So uh, yeah, what I want to talk with you about a little bit is the topic of my book, and, and thank you very much for getting a copy for your library as well. Uh, and and uh, this covers a, a very wide range of topics, so we can only scrape the surface here. But I want to talk with you in, in broad general terms about why animals matter for pandemics and climate change and other global health and environmental threats, but then also why pandemics and climate change and other global health and environmental threats matter for animals and, and the policy implications. And this book and this discussion, of course, is taking place in the context of a very disruptive, tumultuous, uh, difficult time for all of us, right? This is about the two year anniversary, almost exactly actually the two year anniversary of the very first trip that I canceled <laughs> in March, 2020, uh, when, when I was feeling very inconvenienced ab about uh, not being able to travel during spring break. And, and then of course, here we are two years later, uh, very slowly trying in fits and starts to gradually recover from an ongoing pandemic to say nothing of other disruptive global events ranging from war to various extreme weather events. So, so the context must be kept in mind. And for me, I have lived in New York during the pandemic with my partner and my dog. My dog has given me a lot of comfort and solace. I think the same is true of many other people. And in general, stories about animals uh, grabbed our attention during, during the pandemic and during a lot of the other threats that people were dealing with uh, over the past two years, right? So, so things have been hard, but many people adopted animals, adoption rates increased. And so many people brought cats and dogs and other animals into their homes. Some people also abandoned cats and dogs, but we can set that aside for the moment. And uh, similarly, wild animals in, in many respects did better. Uh, as, as fewer people were on the roads, wild animals were less at risk of getting hit by cars. And they were even able to reclaim some spaces. There were a lot of reports of, of wild animals venturing into cities and onto transportation systems where they might not have been safe. Some of those stories were exaggerated. Some wild animals, of course, were still killed. But generally speaking, it, it was an interesting moment for some captive animals and some wild animals. But there were a lot of uh, sad stories too. So, so as we all know, 2020 started with uh, the Australia bushfires, which killed an estimated 3 billion animals that we knew about. And that was also around when the Amazon wildfires were, were going on, also killing very many wild animals. Then when COVID-19 started, of course, that disrupted the lives of many animals in, in bad, difficult ways. So for example, you might recall the mink pandemic from 2020. Minks are, are highly susceptible to infectious respiratory diseases like COVID-19. So as soon as the virus reached mink farms, minks are farmed for their fur, as soon as the virus reached mink farms, uh, they did contract COVID-19, novel variants emerged, and humans out of fear for their own safety culled the minks. In other words, we, we killed them as quickly and efficiently as possible, often by gassing or smothering them, which is not a pleasant way to die. And many other farmed animals died in similar ways. We, we killed them on farms either because we were scared of catching diseases or because of supply chain breakdowns that made it impossible to send them to slaughterhouses. And so there was some good news involving animals, but there was also a lot of hard news involving animals. And that continued right into 2021. Uh, and not only with the pandemic, but also with the kinds of extreme weather events that will be more common in a world reshaped by climate change. For example, in the Pacific Northwest in 2021, there were floods that killed hundreds of thousands of farmed animals who lived on farms near coastal areas. And then that same year, there was also a heat wave in the same region, the Pacific Northwest, that killed billions of, of farmed and wild animals. And so what this all reminds us is that we share the world with other animals and the things that we do to ourselves, we also do to them. We have a common fate now. 
And so when human activity increases the number of outbreaks in the world and increases the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like fires and floods, that impacts other animals too. And then an even more tragic part of the story is that many of the activities that are causing more outbreaks, causing more fires, causing more floods, those activities are in and of themselves exploiting and exterminating billions of animals, trillions of animals in some cases per year. And this is why animals are part of global health and environmental threats like pandemics and climate change. They are a central part of the story, both as causes and as victims, as causes through no faults of their own, because the things that we are doing to them are increasing the risk of pandemics, increasing the severity of climate change. And then as victims, because pandemics and climate change then impact, and in many cases harm, non-human animals. And so what I wanna talk with you about today is why that is, why human uh, exploitation and extermination of other animals is contributing to pandemics and climate change, why pandemics and climate change are then contributing to non-human suffering and death. Uh, and then, and this is the good part because all of that is really bad and sad so far. And then the good part is what we can do about that. And, and I will suggest and argue that we can and should include animals in global health environmental policy by reducing our use of them as part of our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts and increasing our support for them as part of our pandemic and climate change adaptation efforts. And I'll suggest some ways of doing that. So there will be some difficult parts to hear, but that will all be in the service of helping us understand the current situation well enough that we can face the things that we can and should be doing. And then that will be the part that warrants some cautious optimism. So there will be a, a, a cautiously good ending to, to this story. So first of all, consider, for simplicity, three industries, global industries, that are harming animals and contributing to health and environmental threats like pandemics and climate change. One industry is factory farming, another is deforestation, and another is the wildlife trade. So I'll briefly explain what these are and how they impact animals. Factory farming, otherwise known as industrial animal agriculture, is a way of intensively breeding and raising and killing animals at scale so that we can produce their meat uh, as seemingly efficiently as possible. So if we eat an estimated 70 billion land animals per year, many more if you include aquatic animals, you have to do that in an industrial fashion. There is no way of, of uh, eating that many animals through non-industrial means. There would be no way to do that. So we breed them to grow as big as possible, as fast as possible. We mutilate many of them without anesthesia. Uh, we force them to live in, in cramped and toxic conditions with lots of other animals. And then we transport them on hot trucks without food or water or veterinary care. And then we slaughter them on essentially industrial disassembly lines. This is not a situation we would want any loved one, including an animal, to have to endure, but billions of, of animals endure it every year. Then deforestation, of course, is when we cut down trees to clear land for agriculture, for transportation, for, for urban development, for all sorts of human activities. And of course, this harms many animals because, well, we have to destroy their habitats and we have to kill many of them in the process in, in order to make all of that human activity and human space possible. And then the wildlife trade is when we capture wild animals and use them for various purposes. It might be food, it might be medicine, it might be entertainment, uh, it might be other, other things too. But once again, this is a, a way of invasively going into their territories and then taking them away from their families, from their homes, and then putting them on cars, trucks, boats, and so on, taking them to new places and keeping them in cages and then either keeping them in captivity indefinitely or killing them. All of this harms them and imposes health risks on them. Okay, now these are clearly bad for animals and the scale is worth emphasizing. As I said, about 70 billion domesticated uh, land animals annually, um, more than 100 billion domesticated aquatic animals annually, one to three trillion fishes killed each year in industrial fishing, now even a trillion insects per year killed in insect farms, uh, and that could go as high as 50 trillion by, by the end of this decade. So a huge amount of animal suffering and death, much of which, as I'll suggest a little bit later, is completely unnecessary at this point because we do have access to alternative food systems that we could be investing in instead. 
Okay. But how do these systems contribute to pandemics and climate change and other threats? So first of all, factory farming contributes to health threats like pandemics in many ways. When you put that many animals in, in close confinement together, they are going to get sick and pass diseases back and forth. And when you breed them to grow as big as possible, as fast as possible, they come into existence with weakened immune systems and then live in conditions that contribute to their illness. And so that is a really good breeding ground for pathogens to develop and spread between animals and from animals to humans. And then when you uh, use antibiotics and other antimicrobials to suppress the spread of disease and stimulate growth, which by the way, 80% of antibiotic use in the United States is all on animal farms, 80%. When you do that, it becomes the ideal breeding ground for antibiotic and antimicrobial resistant pathogens like COVID-19. So factory farms are ideal breeding grounds, either for new uh, diseases or bacteria mutations or for current ones to spread very quickly across non-human and human populations. Uh, now, similarly, deforestation also contributes to pandemics because when we cut down a bunch of trees, we encounter more wild animals and they carry thousands of viruses that have the potential to transfer to humans. And we reduce forested biodiversity. And when you reduce forested biodiversity, that makes it easier for some zoonotic diseases to spread across animal populations. So cutting down forests makes diseases uh, spread across animals and then from them to us. And then of course the wildlife trade also contributes to pandemics because again, we take wild animals and then uh, put them in close proximity to each other and to humans in situations where they can get sick, transfer diseases and then transfer them to us. It might be that COVID-19 originated at a, a live market that is part of the wildlife trade. It might not have originated that way. We might never know for sure, but in any case, a pandemic could very easily originate that way. Uh, when you take animals who carry diseases, make them sick, put them together with other animals, and then deal with them individually, you are more likely to uh, contract diseases that way. So all three of these industries contribute to global health threats like pandemics. Now, what about environmental threats like climate change? So factory farming is a leading consumer of land and water uh, and energy. Uh, you have to clear a lot of land in order to create space for animals to exist and then create more space to grow plants to feed to the animals. So you basically have to create two farm systems, the animal farm system and then the plant farm system to feed to the animals. So lots of land, way more than a plant-based food system would require. Lots of water, because you gotta give the animals water to drink, you gotta clean the cages and so on. So lots of land, lots of water, huge consumer of resources, huge emitter of waste and pollution, the animals have to go to the bathroom somewhere. This is way too many animals going to the bathroom way too much for the planet to absorb it all. So it just accumulates. This is part of what makes them sick. And then people dig huge football field sized pits in the land surrounding the farms and they dump all the waste in those pits. And then it pollutes the local communities, which tend to be uh, disproportionately low income communities, often low income communities of color. And so this is a local public health risk. But then it creates lots of pollution and greenhouse gas emissions that makes it a global uh, environmental threat as well. In particular, about 9% of global carbon emissions, 37% of global methane emissions, and 65% uh, of global nitrous oxide emissions, adding up to about 14.5%, 14.5% of global human caused greenhouse gas emissions, all attributable to this one industry, factory farming. And beef and dairy farming are especially problematic in this way because they need lots of land and they emit lots of methane. Uh, now deforestation contributes to climate change too because trees and forests are the best way we have to capture and store carbon dioxide in the ground. And so when you cut down a bunch of trees, you release carbon dioxide currently being stored in the ground, you release that into the atmosphere and you diminish the planet's ability to capture and store carbon dioxide in the future. And this is part of why, by the way, factory farming contributes to climate change so much. Part of why it does is because cows emit a lot of methane and, and in general, factory farms emit lots of greenhouse gases. But the other part of why they contribute so much to climate change is we need to clear so much land for the farms and then to grow the plants to feed to the animals. And so 
all of the public health and environmental risks of deforestation, those can be partly attributed to animal agriculture too, which is a leading driver of deforestation. Uh, so not, not a good situation. Okay. And then uh, the wildlife trade causes environmental problems too, particularly biodiversity loss, because the more endangered a species is, the more economic value we attach to that species. And, and so the more our efforts to make money by capturing members of that species drive it to extinction. And uh, so, so in general, all three of, of these industries are bad for public health and bad for the environment. Now, briefly, I want to emphasize the second half of this story too, because animals matter for pandemics and climate change, not only as causes through no faults of their own, but also as victims. When pandemics and climate change occur, it harms them all over again. So, so when we harm them, those activities also make these threats worse. And then when these threats get worse, it then harms animals again. So they really get, get hit on both sides of this equation. So briefly with pandemics, of course, part of how pandemics can harm animals is when outbreaks occur, they can affect animals too. Like I said, many non-human animals are, are susceptible to zoonotic diseases like COVID-19 as well. Uh, minks have tested positive for it. Deer have tested positive for it. Many of the same respiratory diseases that harm humans also harm other primates and uh, sometimes cats and other animals. So, so one way uh, an outbreak or an epidemic or a pandemic can harm other animals is simply because they get sick. But then another way that it can harm other animals is through an increase in human violence or neglect. As I said before, part of what made animals so vulnerable during COVID-19 is that we abandoned animals we would have otherwise taken care of, or we culled or euthanized or sacrificed animals we otherwise might have treated a little bit differently because we were scared of getting sick or because we lacked the resources or the will necessary to take care of them. Okay. And then climate change is going to impact animals on a, an even higher scale, right? Uh, climate change is a global phenomenon, is reshaping the planet in, in ways that will affect humans and non-humans all over the world, right? This is going to be a situation, even in the better scenarios, if, even if we keep it to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels or two. Even then, climate change will involve melting ice caps, rising sea levels, uh, a decrease in ocean oxygen, an increase in ocean acidity, uh, an increase in coastal flooding, an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like fires and floods, uh, regional conflict over land and water and food and uh, mass migrations of various kinds, novel forms of conflict between humans and non-humans or between non-humans and other non-humans, this is going to affect everybody all over the world. And it already is. Species are already going extinct because of climate change. Your species are already migrating. And then humans are doing what? Welcoming in them into our communities? Of course not. We're calling them invasive species and we're killing them, right? Uh, and, and that will only happen more as the, the climate migration crisis for both humans and other animals gets worse. And so once again, as with pandemics, climate change is going to impact animals not only directly through fires and floods and, and other extreme weather events, but also indirectly through an increase in human violence and neglect. We are gonna kill animals more because we will experience them as invading our spaces and we'll neglect them more because we'll be dealing with our own disruptions and we might lack the the capacity or the, the political will to take care of them as much as we might have done otherwise. So in both the case of pandemics and climate change, you see animals as a central part of the story on both sides of the equation, right? Our exploitation and extermination of trillions of animals per year is contributing to global health and environmental threats like pandemics and climate change. And then when those disruptions occur, they harm animals directly by exposing them to outbreaks and fires and floods and other issues and indirectly by exposing them to increased human violence and neglect. Uh, so that is the part that is hard to hear. <laughs> the part that I hope will be a little bit easier to hear is that there are things that we can and, and should be doing to improve this situation. And, and I can uh, close by briefly mentioning some of them. Some, some big picture uh, frameworks that we can keep in mind for pursuing health and environmental policy and then some specific health and environmental policy approaches that might be useful. So first of all, general framework for thinking about health and environmental policy. Um, in, in general, I am suggesting that we should include animals in health and environmental policy by first of all, reducing our use of them, 
as part of our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts. So to the degree that we want to reduce the risk of pandemics and the severity of climate change, we have to slow and stop factory farming, deforestation, and the wildlife trade as part of that process. There is no way to meet our global health and environmental targets, including the methane and deforestation targets that nations agreed upon at COP26 uh, uh, in, in the fall. No way that we can meet those targets without very substantially reducing our exploitation and extermination of other animals in these industries. And then secondly, by increasing our support for animals as part of our pandemic and climate change adaptation efforts. So as we rebuild the world, as we try to build new, more resilient, more sustainable uh, cities and food systems and energy systems and transportation systems so that we can meet our own needs as humans in a rapidly changing planet, we can consider the interests and needs of other animals too. And if we simply do that, if we simply bring them into the conversation and ask what might benefit them too, we might find all kinds of low hanging fruit opportunities to make little tweaks to our designs so that we can make these new cities and food and energy and transportation systems more accommodating for many of the other animals who are going to be living in these environments as well. And so what does that look like more concretely? I can close by mentioning a, a few quick examples and, and then I, I would like to leave as much time as possible for conversation and, and see what questions you have or what objections or, or other thoughts that you have. So with respect to some specific policies, uh, the, the major issue on the mitigation side is food. We really, really, really need to end factory farming. We need to stop intensively, industrially uh, farming other animals. And, and as I mentioned before, part of why we need to do that is because what happens on factory farms is a major contributor to pandemics and climate change and animal suffering. But the other part of why we need to do that is that factory farming is a major contributor to deforestation, which all over again is a major contributor to pandemics and climate change and animal suffering. So, so factory farming is really at the heart of this. And, and to end uh, factory farming, it is not enough to simply replace each factory farmed animal with a non-factory farmed animal. In other words, to, to take all of the animals currently being factory farmed and farm them through non-industrial systems instead. You would need many planets worth of land and water in order to farm that many animals for a rising human population. So the only way that we can improve our global food systems at scale is by very substantially replacing our dependence on animal agriculture with a dependence on plant agriculture and other alternatives. And we can do that in all kinds of ways, through informational policies, enacting policies to educate the public about animal welfare and the links between uh, human and non-human environmental health, through financial uh, policies, financial incentives. For example, we can implement full cost pricing. This is uh, a way of making industries pay for the public health and environmental consequences of their activity. And if we made uh, factory farmers, if we made them pay for the, the public health and environmental consequences of factory farming, the, the price of factory farmed meat would, would go up by a factor of 10. It would, it would be way more expensive uh, than it is right now. And that would of course drive consumer demand in, in the other direction. And regulation, uh, part of what keeps factory farmed meat so cheap is, is of course that we subsidize it and we don't make them pay for all the harms that they cause. But the other reason is we let them cause all sorts of harms in the first place. We let them exploit workers. We let them exploit animals. We let them treat lots of people and animals terribly. And so if we implement full cost pricing, make them pay for the harms that they cause and implement proper regulations to keep them from causing the worst harms to vulnerable workers and, and non-human animals, that again will make me uh, reveal its true cost and it will be much more expensive and people will naturally choose alternatives. And then in the meantime, we can be subs subsidizing those alternatives. We can be investing in healthful, sustainable, plant-based agriculture and plant-based meat like Beyond Meat and Impossible uh, Burgers and even cult cultivated meat. So, so people might not be aware of this, but scientists are developing the ability to grow actual meat in a brewery-like factory by taking a little cell culture from an animal, just a cell culture, like a little, little needle, 
And then you bring those cells and you put them in a growth medium, get a little scaffolding going. And then literally in the same way that you might make beer in a brewery, you can grow meat in a factory. And we still have some hurdles to overcome, but this, this will be a reality. And these alternatives, plant foods, plant-based meat and cultivated meats can and will give us tasty food, healthful food, uh, sustainable food without having to breed and raise and kill billions, hundreds of billions of animals per year and drive the planet to collapse in the process. So that's the main thing that we need to do. But then, as I said, in addition to reducing our use of animals, we also need to increase our support for animals. And there are all kinds of things that we can do around that too. One is investing in research and advocacy. We need more research so that we can know more how to protect other animals and advocacy so that we can care more about protecting other animals. But then we can also do basic things like uh, create animal welfare impact assessments or include animal welfare in the other impact assessments that drive policy decisions. When we need to pick policies, we go create some impact assessments. We figure out what the expected impacts of this policy will be. And if we simply include animal welfare as a variable, then we bring them into the conversation and we can think about them. We can consider them when selecting policies. And once we do that, once we bring them into the conversation, get an animal welfare office in a, a local government, include animal welfare and impact assessments, uh, talk about them before we make a decision, then there are all kinds of things we can do. When we reform education systems, we include more coverage, more material about animal health and welfare and the links between human and non-human uh, and environmental health and, and well-being. And uh, when, when we create new jobs, when we have jobs programs so that we can have just transitions for workers transitioning away from uh, jobs in, in the food and energy and transportation sectors that we need to end, we can create new jobs where they're caring for animals instead of the old jobs where they're harming them. So we can train more veterinarians. Uh, more people to provide animals with care, more people to provide forests with, with care. Uh, and then social services, we can set aside more resources for food and medicine for animals. We can treat their health issues. We can have resources that we can use to treat their health issues. And that way, when the next outbreak occurs, we'll have other things that we can do besides simply killing them all. We won't need to kill them all because we'll be able to take care of them and limit the spread of diseases that way in the same way that we aspire to do for ourselves. And infrastructure, when we're building new cities, uh, which we need to do so that they can be more resilient and sustainable, we can do basic things like include bird-friendly glass on new buildings and, and vehicles so that there are fewer collisions with birds that harm us and them. And uh, we can include animal overpasses or underpasses or corridors on new transportation systems. So again, when we build the green rails of the future, there'll be fewer collisions with animals. And again, that will be better for us and for them. Now in the long run, we might need to seek very uh, much more transformative changes to our basic social and political and economic and ecological structures. And we could talk about that in the discussion if, if you want. But in the short term, there are these low hanging fruit ways. We can very substantially reduce the harm that we are causing to other animals, very substantially reduce our complicity in health and environmental threats like pandemics and climate change, and therefore very substantially reduce the indirect harms that we're causing to other animals via these threats. And we can be building capacity to take care of animals on the other end to the degree that we are still harming them as much as we might be trying to stop. And so those are my uh, initial suggestions. As, as ambitious as those are, they're easy, relatively speaking. The harder things will be what come next in the, in the coming decades. But if we start there, then I think we can make a lot of progress. And so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there to see what questions or comments you have. Uh, but thank you for listening. I really appreciate it.